Hey guys, how you doing? Uh, my name is Dave Smith, Professor Dave Smith, Master Dave Smith, and I am going to be your your guide through Mexican American history this semester. History 43, the Mexican American and the history of the United States, part one or section one. This is the first half of a two semester or two section course. Um, I want to start off with with a slightly informal sort of lecture today. This is the way I've always done this. I've been teaching this class since 2000, 2001. At this point it's 2016, so it's 15, 16 years. And I like to start off by talking about names and identity. And the way that I like to begin talking about names and identity is by talking about, just for a little bit, muralism, Chicano muralism, or Mexican-American muralism. Um, here in Los Angeles, California. So the first image I'd like to show you is the one you see right here in front of you for the last minute or so. This is this is a mural I discovered um, off a vacant lot in downtown LA about, I don't know, 14, 15 years back. Some of you may recognize a couple of these figures on the extreme left of your screen. You see a portrait of Zapata, Emiliano Zapata, the great revolutionary figure from the Mexican Revolution of 1910. And on the extreme right, uh, you see Cesar Chavez, the leader of the United Farm Workers Movement back in the late 1960s um, and th through the 70s and 1980s until he passed away. Uh, and then off to the side of Cesar, you see this big pride, right? And then in between Cesar and Zapata, you see this other figure, who resembles no one that I know of in Mexican history or Mexican-American history or any history at all. I don't recognize that face and I've never had a student who recognized that face. I've shown this image to a thousand different people, I'd say, over the years and nobody knows who that is. Except I think that I do know who it is and I think that it's the artist. My theory is that Caesar and Zapata are like bookends here of proud Mexican or Mexican-American Chicano identity. And then you have the artist in between there saying, like, this is who I am. You know, these are the people that that uh, mean something to me, that have some sort of stake in terms of representing my heritage, my identity as a Mexican, Mexican-American, Mexicano, Chicano, Latino, Hispanic. I don't know. I don't know the way that the artists would have identified themselves because I don't even know that that is the artist. It's just a theory. Now, if you're looking up at the upper uh, right hand up here in the very corner of the mural, you can see some writing up there, right, identifying information. But no, nah, not really. It's kind of it's it's almost like that was the very last thing they painted, and they they used the wrong kind of paint, or it didn't get protected or rained. But the the paint ran a little bit and. There's nothing that you can make sense of up there. But at any rate, pride, right? Uh, a big part of the history of Chicano muralism has to do with pride, okay? Pride in city. There are more murals in Los Angeles than in any other city in the world. Mexico City, New York City, any city. <clears throat> LA is the mural capital of the world, and certainly there's a big part of Los Angeles within... Almost every Chicano mural sometimes, you know, sort of hidden or or metaphored or similed into the background. And sometimes it's very in your face like, hey, I wouldn't even exactly call this a mural, right? It's more an example of graffiti art. But still, it's part of that same artistic and historical dialogue. So, okay, pride in city. What about pride in ethnic identity or tribal identity? The, the term tribe is a very controversial term within historiography over the last 50 years or so, because some people see it as a sort of westernized or white person's history way of trying to make sense of the indigenous people of other parts of the world other than Europe or, well, even in the United States, Native Americans, right? The Navajo tribe, the Cherokee tribe, right? Africa is full of tribes, the aboriginal tribes of Australia. Tribes, some people see it as a as a bad word, as a as a pejorative term, as a negative. Other people say, no, a tribe is just another way of talking about ethnic identity. Right? Within the United States you have many, many different ethnic identities or ethnicities. You have Italian Americans, German Americans, yeah? 
Yeah, boy. Right? And you have some Irish Americans right here, there, and everywhere on the great country of ours, and Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, I mean, on and on and on. Mexican Americans. Mexican Americans are the single largest tribe or ethnic group within the United States. I saw this this image, I found this behind a warehouse in East LA. It just it was a random discovery. But I like the way that it's juxtaposed so that looking at it in the distance you see downtown LA there, right? The center of, of, of history and politics and most of the important decisions ever made in Los Angeles for 130 or 40 years now. I like the way these two things are juxtaposed because East LA exists as a kind of satellite of downtown Los Angeles historically, right? Thousands and tens of thousands and even a hundred or two hundred thousand or so people of Mexican descent drive across the bridges over the LA River into or through or nearby downtown LA and then they move off into all other parts of, of the greater Los Angeles sprawl to work and they go east and they go north and they go south. But think about that 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 sort of metaphorical journey of crossing the river. It's like crossing the river into the United States from Mexico for work to find a better life. Crossing the Los Angeles River into the greater Los Angeles and then every day at the end of the hard work day crossing back, coming back into East L.A., to whichever part of East L.A. we're talking about, Boyle Heights or <clears throat> El Sereno or City Terrace or Highland Park or, or whatever. It's just kind of interesting, right? There's this tribe, this very specific sort of identity, this people that live here and out there in the distances, all the money and the power and kind of provocative, I think. But okay, so tribal or ethnic pride and identity. Do you find that within Chicano murals? You betcha. Okay, what about racial pride? This is on the front, or it used to be on the front, I don't know if it is anymore, of a community center in the Pico Union area just east of downtown Los Angeles or on the east edge of downtown La Raza, right? For Chicanos in the late 60s, 1970s, um, to say La Raza was like African American saying black power. Okay, La Raza, the race. The race. What race? Well, what it is, this is a, a term that's much older than the Chicano movement. It actually goes way back to the 1920s um, to this character here, who was the Secretary of Education. After the Mexican Revolution, um, his name was Jose Vasconcelos, and he wrote this book called La Raza Cosmica, Mission de la Raza Iberoamericana, okay, the mission of the cosmic race, and the cosmic race. What is the cosmic race? Well, Vasconcelos argued that the people of Mexico were not Indians, and they were not Spaniards, and they were not Africans, but in fact, they were a mixture of all three peoples, mostly Indians and Spaniards, but still a fair amount of African blood in the mix. There was a new kind of a human being that was gestated in Mexico in the early 1500s and on into the 16th, 17th, 1800s and up into the 20th century. And that being was the mestizo, the mixed race identity of Mexico. Vasconcelos argued that a new kind of human being, a new race of man, was created in Mexico, and that it was the destiny of that race, La Raza Cosmica, to lead mankind into a better and enlightened and glorious future, a cosmic future, a future amongst the stars, to other planets. This wasn't a big science fiction novel or anything, guys. He didn't really talk about, you know, meeting aliens or something or being abducted and probed or whatever. He was simply trying to create a racial ideology for Mexico that would ennoble and uplift the Mexican people by convincing them, let's say, that because of their particularly unique history within the greater Latin American history experience and the greater global experience, they were the race of the future. Okay. True? False? I don't know. 
uh, the future is still coming, right? Every second, every minute, every hour, every day, every week, the future is being invented. Maybe he was right, but maybe that's not a future that we've arrived at yet. Maybe it'll take another 10 or 50 or 100 or 200 or 1,000 years. I don't know. But again, pride. Pride in race. Pride in ethnicity. Pride in your city. It's a big, big part of Chicano muralism. Okay. Now, some of you may be asking yourselves, who's this white dude, el gringo pendejo, who's here, like telling me about Mexican-American history? You know, well, can a white guy, a gringo, honky, bohunk, can a white guy teach Mexican-American history, African-American history? Can white people only teach white people's history? And if your answer is yes, well, then, by that token, what you're saying is that a white person cannot understand any history other than their own. And to take that one step further, you're saying that African Americans can't, African Americans can't understand anyone but themselves, nor Mexican or Chinese Americans or, and Jews can't understand Catholics, right? And I guess men can't understand women and vice versa. I mean, that's a bunch of nonsense, guys. If you're interested in something and devoted enough to something to bend your will towards that something and focus on it and investigate or research it, think about it, make sense of it, take classes, get a degree, whatever, of course, anyone can teach anything, okay? But still, I am sensitive to this question or, you know, your potential suspicion that I might not be the dude for you, okay, the guy that can teach this class. I bring this question up because I think it is a legitimate question to talk about. It's, it's, a, it's of interest, but also because one of the very first times I taught this class, I was about 15 minutes into the introductory lecture, and some student just kind of shouted out, man, what's some white dude doing teaching? Like, he was very bothered. And so we talked about it, etc., and so on. By the time the semester was over, he was convinced that I could teach Mexican-American history. But it gave me a new sort of entry point into the course to sort of start the course by talking about this very question and sort of proving my bona fides or convincing you guys, this class, the next class, every class for the rest of my teaching career, that, yeah, I'm qualified to teach this class. Okay, now, let me continue to sell myself to you. <laughs> as an authority on this topic by looking at some more murals. You may wonder about me and this mural thing. This this was actually the, the birth of my fascination with the Mexican-American history and Mexican history. Um, really came from muralism because art history was my minor when I was going to Loyola Marymount University back in the 1990s. And I got really interested in the great muralists of Mexican history, Diego Rivera, David Alfaro Saqueros, Jose Orozco, Rufino Tamayo, um, Jorge Gonzalez Camarena, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then from that, I got interested in Chicano, his, Chicano muralism. That led to me photographing over a thousand Chicano murals, not just in Los Angeles, but in California, Arizona, New Mexico. So yeah, this is something I'm really into. So okay, here we have a mural located on Highland Park. This is only about half of it. I just want to show you this chunk of it right now, but it's twice this big. It's called Tenochtitlan, the wall that talks. Tenochtitlan was the capital of the Aztec Empire. We're going to talk about that a lot in the next bunch of weeks to come. But okay, the wall that talks. You can see a lot of interesting things here. Again, you see Cesar Chavez, right, with the grapes in his hands. Emiliano Zapata up to the left there, next to this Aztec warrior and the sunstone. You see Subcomandante Marcos on the far right of that triumvirate above Caesar, the leader of the Zapatista rebellion of the 1990s and on up to this point. The woman between them, La Adelita, Little Adele. Pancho Villa's girlfriend at the time of the Mexican Revolution. You see this figure of the future, half man, half machine, clasping the Aztec's new fire in his left hand with the tail of Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, coming out of it and then rolling forward and into the other part of the mural. 
I could talk about just this image for another 15 minutes, but we don't have that much time to spend just on this. I just wanted to look at this and think about this in relation to what I've been talking about. Pride, ethnic pride, racial pride, city pride, you know, names and identity. Just kind of roll through this stuff with me, guys. Just a quick glance at some things. This is a mural that has no title. It's actually on three sides of a building down in Wilmington. It's a uh, like a corner grocery um, liquor mart, you know, in the community down there. I just like it because it's such a great portrait of Zapata, right? This portrait of these two guys, members of rival gangs back in the day. This is an old mural um, with the knives laid down to their feet and a cross symbolizing peace, right? Instead of knives in their hands, now they've got books in their hands. They're shaking hands. You see the bandanas around their neck. Further back to the left at the beginning of the mural, they're in a knife fight, but the bandanas are over their eyes. As if the artist is simply saying, these guys can't even see that they're the same people. They're the same gente, right? These guys should be, they should be friends, brothers, right? Not fighting. And so further down along the mural here, you see them next to this image of Zapata. And just a very cool part of a very cool mural. Um, this is a couple of images from Chicano Park and Barrio Logan down at the bottom of San Diego. Chicano Park, Chicano Park is very famous. Uh, some of you may know about it. Some of you may have even been there. If you're ever down in San Diego for any period of time, drive down to see a Dodgers game, Dodgers Padres, right? Or if you're going to Tijuana or down to Rosarita, Ensenada, something or other like that, it's literally right off the freeway. You pull off the five, and, and at the bottom of the off-ramp, you're basically there, okay? Um, Chicano Park came into being, well, basically back around in the 1890s. This is this was an area that became it, it became known as Logan Logan Heights actually, and the the Mexican population began to grow there in like the eighteen like around 1900. Okay, not larger. And larger, pardon me, guys, I don't see some really fast here. Yeah, that's right, okay. And by the time you get to World War II, you've got this really big Mexican community at the south end of Logan Heights, and, and this area is called Barrio Logan, right? Or the barrio means a place where Mexican-Americans live. It's not necessarily a pejorative or negative term. So at, at, at the time of World War II, the naval installation at San Diego was expanded dramatically further and further around the bay and when it was expanded south it cut off Barrio Logan's access to the water. They had their own beach there for a long time but we're trying to beat the Nazis and the Japanese and it's like World War II and you know sorry guys but your beach is gonna have to go you can go to the beach somewhere else the Navy needs this. Well this created a lot of resentment and frustration amongst people and more of that came bubbling up to the surface in the 1950s and 60s when they they built a, this huge off-ramp for Interstate 5 right through the barrio and then the bridge connecting Interstate 5 to the Cor to the Coronado Bridge across the bay then that was built and that cut it again so basically you had something like 1,500 homes that had to be torn down. People were forced to move. I mean, they got paid for their property and everything, but still there was this huge forced removal. But there was a kind of gentleman's agreement made between the city government in San Diego and the people of Barrio Logan that this area in and around these, these off-ramps and overpasses and bridges, that this would be turned into a big park. Well, a year went by and another year and a bunch more years. And then one day there were all these bulldozers lined up early one morning and people asked, hey, what's going on? They said, oh, we're going to be building a new uh, CHP, California Highway Patrol installation here in a parking lot. So basically it's like the city either forgot or just kind of went, ah, whatever. And they were bailing on the idea of the park. Well, the people of the barrio kind of rose up and hundreds of them created an occupation in the park like a sit-in in the civil rights movement. This is in 1970. Hundreds and hundreds of people filled up the park, formed rings around the bulldozers for 12 days. They wouldn't move. Ultimately, an agreement was reached. The plans for the CHP 
building and all that canceled or relocated, let's say, and Chicano Park was created during the occupation. They started painting these murals. When I say these, I don't mean just these three. There's literally like a hundred murals in Chicano Park. But the beginning of the murals of Chicano Park were during that 12-day occupation. And then they painted more, more, and more. Um, in the 1990s, there was this move to retrofit the bridge, the connection between I-5 and the Coronado Bridge, and that was going to ruin a bunch of the murals and create a lot of problems. So the people, once again, kind of stood up for the park and the murals, and so ultimately the city had to cover the murals and protect them from damage so that the retrofitting could go on without any problems for these historic and, you know, very important pieces of public art. That's what you see right here in the middle. There's no retrofitting, right? Say, Chicano Park. Um, it's, right. it's a great place, Chicano Park. You should really, really, really check it out. If you ever had the chance, I highly recommend it. If you're interested at all in Mexican-American history, then you're going to take this. And now here is a mural by my favorite Chicano muralist, uh, Paul Boteo. Uh, I should have his name there, actually. Pardon me for that. But anyway, it's called The Wall That Speaks, Sings, and Shouts. Okay, and I, I'm not even going to start getting into this, guys, really, because it is such a complex mural, and there's so much you can say about it. It's I, I want to apologize for the three portion image here. It's almost impossible to get a good shot, one big shot of this mural, just because of various logistics having to do with lighting and trees that are in the way and etc. I've gone out to look at this mural or I've been out there looking at a lot of murals and, and physically been in this park 10, 12, 15 times over the years. I, I've never gotten like one good shot. So I kind of put three pieces together here, and I can give you an almost perfect image um, of of the mural, right? It's a great big one. You can see by the size of the cars, massive on the side of a community center in Ruben Salazar Park. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, take my History 44 class, and the big assignment at the end of the semester is a mural tour, where I give you this big map and all these questions, and you drive around East L.A., and you look at these murals, and you think about them and answer questions, and... It's cool. Students really dig it as an assignment, so here I am pimping my next semester's class, right? All right, another one. Very, very famous mural. El Nuevo Fuego, or the New Fire, painted by East Los Streetscapers. Uh, two guys with assistants. The two guys are Wayne Healy and David Boteo, the older brother of Paul Boteo, who did the previous mural that I just showed you. This is on the side of what used to be a very famous historic clothing uh, emporium in downtown LA on Broadway called the Victor Clothing Company. On this side of the building, further back here to the left where you can't see, there's a giant mural. There's this mural. On the far side, there's two giant murals. And on the inside, when you went into Victor Clothing, all around the interior walls of the store, big murals, the the owner, it's a company that, that was around for about 100 years, and in the 1960s and 70s, the, the same family was owned it, and the guy that was in charge at that point, the son, the grandson, whatever, um, he just really loved the idea of trying to create art for the public, you know, draw attention and, you know, good publicity to the store. It was a store that catered primarily to Mexican-Americans in terms of selling um, bridal gowns, tuxedos, you know, things for prom, formal occasion, formal wear, okay. Um, and again, almost exclusively to Mexican-Americans just because of where it was located and so on and forth, so on and so forth. So at the time of the 1984 Olympics, Victor Clothing Company contracted with East Los Streetscapers to create a big mural celebrating the 1984 Olympics and connecting it back to the 1932 Olympics 52 years earlier in Los Angeles at the Coliseum, right? 52 years, which is the same number of years in an Aztec calendar round. The Aztecs had a, they had a cyclical history, understanding of history. And history, like our history, runs in, in sets of 100, right? Centuries. Well, their century was 52 years long. So... Because of that connection to the Aztecs, you see this pyramid up here. 
Maybe you can see it. I wish I had good details of this. I don't. I'm sorry. Nothing that can be enlarged in a way that you can really see it here. I've tried. But anyway, you see this pyramid. It's You can't tell here, but it's broken. And then next to it, you see the number 8.1, which is a reference to the 1995 or, or the 1985 earthquake uh, in Mexico City, which caused like a lot of destruction, a lot of devastation. All these figures down in here are people that won Olympic gold in the 84 Olympics. Okay, you know, you see the Special Olympics side of here. You see this figure kind of soaring up through the metal, right? And this great sort of like move like Superman, this kind of Olympian, naked Olympian figure with the torch in hand. El Nuevo Fuego, the new flame, the new fire. At the end of every 52-year calendar around the Aztecs had this ceremony that they referred to as the new fire or the new flame ceremony where they believed that they were helping the gods to give birth to a new 52-year cycle of life for the world and for humanity. And I'll go into this more in another lecture, but very cool the way all these things are incorporated with into this one, you know, sort of epic mural here. It's really a, it's a great piece of art. You can see it today if you want to, right down on Broadway and like 2nd or 1st Street. Still there, even though the Victor Clothing Company, the inside, it's a different business now, but all the murals are st still there because they've been declared historic landmarks, so can't ever do anything to them. Here is a mural, not by my favorite muralist in Los Angeles, but by the one that I think is technically the most accomplished. He's just the most gifted painter. Um, it's a guy named George Yepes. The mural is called Tikkun Olam, which is a it's an ancient Jewish concept that comes out of the the teachings of the rabbis, the rabbinical teachings of Judaism, tikkun olam means to repair the world, that it's the duty of Jewish people to use their minds and their hearts, their money and their energy to help people, to fix things, to stand up for social justice, to, to, to matter, to help to repair the world, right? It's on the side, if you look over here on the left, of a, like a parking structure, of a, of a medical center in East LA. And so over here you see, you know, this image of Christ on the cross, and Old Testament patriarchs, and then you see Christ again down here with this balance across his shoulders. And then over here, there is a figure of an angel, the angel of resurrection. And what is she cradling in her arms? It's Los Angeles, downtown LA. Here you see city of Los Angeles, the seal of LA. Right, or of Los Angeles, sort of framed as if it was the the sunny halo that always is painted behind the Virgin of Guadalupe, Our Lady of Guadalupe. Right, it's just a fantastic mural. I could again talk about it a lot more than this, tell you a lot more, but we only have so much time. Okay, another mural, very famous, super famous, in fact, one of the most famous of all Chicano murals. This is called. The Wall That Cracked Open, and it was painted by a young guy named Willie Aron in 1972. This is in an alley behind a little strip mall of like five shops on York Avenue in East L.A. And at that time, there was a lot of gang violence in East L.A. And a lot of fighting in this alley, like for reasons I've never been able to find with whatever research I've done. I don't know why this alley mattered so much, but there were two gangs that were constantly fighting over whose turf, whose territory this alley was. Well, one night, Willie Haron's uh, little brother was sent over to the corner market by their grandmother to buy some milk or something. On the way, he sort of walked into a confrontation between these two gangs. He got shot in the head. He survived, but he almost died. So... Willie Aron went out and he painted this image. You can't you can't tell here, but it's about 20, 25 feet high. It, most, this is 90% of the mural right here, okay? The wall that cracked open, right? Like the building is cracking open, and you see this kind of phantasmagoric image of, of like death or, or maiming or mayhem of some sort. Like, it, like it's like his brother, 
but not his brother. It's like it's like a metaphor for his brother, right? And then the grandma, little abuelita here, right, with the cross, and then the two gang members, you know, coming up in each other's faces, and fantastic mural. Well, the problem is that these guys in the gang, the same way they were arguing about the mural, they are or about the alley. They start. They, they then began to argue over who owned the mural. And then they begin to tag on it and tag over each other's tags. And Willy Aron repainted the mural and tried to fix it over and over. Finally, after a couple of years, he got so fed up in like 1975 that he put up this plywood cover. Okay, now remember, the mural's about 25 feet high, 20, 25 feet. So this goes up like 15 to 20 feet right here, you know, somewhere in there. So way up high, past the point where these guys could tag on it, he covered it up and he sort of made a statement. It was in the newspapers, you know, saying... I'm not going to uncover this until such a time as I believe that the mural's going to be respected and nobody's going to tag on it, etc. Well, it was covered up just like this for about 25 years, something like that. And then finally, ultimately, uh, there was a time where he felt like it could be taken down. He took it down. He retouched it up um, and actually talked to the gangs within the proximity of the mural and promised them that he would put a tag for each of them into the mural so that they wouldn't have the temptation to represent there, that they would already be represented in the official piece of artwork, right? So very cool, very interesting, and provocative and important Chicano mural. Um, another one, Tome Conciencia, painted by a group of artists, the Taller de Grafica Monumental, or the Taller de Grafica Monumental in 1987, um, it's a group of artists that came up from Mexico City and did this mural on the side of the One Stop Immigration and Legalization Center. It's very complex, a lot going on in here. Once again, we don't have time to talk about it. I'm showing you this more because I want to show you what happened to the mural. That's what happened to the mural. When the One Stop Immigration Center lost their lease and was forced to move, the owner of the building painted over the mural. Awesome, <laughs> right? If you're asking yourself, I can't believe you had the right to do that. Isn't that illegal? No, it, it's not illegal. There are ways that murals can be protected. Um, but this was not a mural like that. So the guy had every right to do whatever he wanted. And what he wanted was a big blue building instead of a fantastic uh, and provocative piece of artwork. But what are you going to do? There's always going to be barbarians out there. We've just got to watch out for them. Like Donald Trump, for example. Sorry, it's an editorial comment. <clears throat> okay, and this is the last mural that I'm going to show you. It doesn't have a title. It's, in a sense, it's more of the tradition of graffiti art, but I use the term mural because I think that it's, it's an image of deadly seriousness and intent. It's about eight feet high. It's on the back of a Bank of America uh, in Highland Park, I, another one that I found on accident, driving down this alley, looking for murals, looking for anything interesting. Here it was. Now, I've, I've got to kind of give you the sense of how to look at this. Okay. I'm standing not in the alley, but in a vacant lot where a house burned down like 50 years ago or something. You can see like the, the, the foundational remains. And then next to that house, or the lot, back behind me, there was a house and about six more houses, and then the end of the dead-end street, cul-de-sac. Then on the other side of the street, six, seven or eight houses, you know, all the way up to the alley. Okay, so you got a little street here. It's one of the avenues. It's like Avenue, like, 69 or 70, something like that up there on Highland Park. And those avenues, a lot of them, some of them cross the Pasadena Freeway, but some of them dead into the freeway. <coughs> If you turned 180 degrees with your back to this image and you look down the street, because the street's so short and the angle of the street, you can see every front yard and you can see even onto the porches of probably 8 out of 13 houses. Okay. In other words, almost anyone in that street, that little miniature neighborhood, if they're outside of their house going out to their car, walking out to the garage, kids playing on the street, hanging out, talking to the neighbors. Not only is the mural visible, 
they can't help but see it if they're looking in that direction. It's just, it's, it dominates the neighborhood. And as I stood there and I looked at this, I just felt it like down in the marrow of my bones as, as strongly as I've ever felt anything. I said, this guy is from this neighborhood. Whether he's alive or dead now, I don't know, but couldn't say. I don't know if he painted it. I don't know if his friend, his brother, his sister, his wife, his daughter, uh, who painted it. But this guy lived here. He went to jail for what? I don't know. Did he kill somebody? Was he wrongly accused of this? Did he that? Whatever. Innocent guy, guilty guy, bad guy, good guy. I don't know. But whatever he was, he was a guy who in prison felt bad about his circumstances. And, and I, I kind of think maybe bad about what he did. I kind of think that the guy probably went to jail for some legitimate reason. Because here he is reaching out through the bars, right? with the rosary beads in his hands. This is like a serious Catholic here, doing penance, doing the Hail Marys, doing the Our Fathers. It's a guy who's looking out, and to me, the look on his face, more powerfully than any written words, what he's saying there, what that face is saying is, I regret what I did. Don't do what I did. Don't follow my footsteps. Don't make the mistake that I made. It's like a message to that little neighborhood or to all the people of Highland Park or people that heard about it and came to look at it. You know, yeah, you all know me and you know what happened to me. You know where I am or you know where I was. Because like I said, maybe he painted it. Maybe this guy got out of prison and painted this as a as a memorial to that time that he spent there where his mind was changed, his heart was changed. I'm reading into this, guys. I'm making this all up. I don't know that any of this is true. I'm only trying to construct a narrative that seems to fit what I see right there. It's one of my favorite murals in all of Los Angeles. It's just, to me, the incredibly powerful piece of art. You might feel differently, but I love it. So I'm kind of in love with Chicano muralism, guys. I dig this stuff. But all right, look, it's been 37 minutes. This is part one of this introductory chat. I'm going to take a quick break. And I'll be right back for part two.